Hello there, I'm Chuck Todd, and welcome to Meet the Press Reports. This is the program where we spend a half hour taking a deep dive into a single issue. This special episode, we are going to take a look at the U.S. military and whether it is ready for America's next war. George Washington once said that being prepared for war is one of the best ways to preserve peace. There is no doubt that the military is prepared to fight terror groups in the Middle East. But the Pentagon says that the biggest national security threats today come from China and Russia. And war with either of those countries is likely to be far different from anything we've ever seen before. In this episode, we will talk to former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Mike Mullen, about whether the U.S. military is ready for the conflicts to come. We will also check in with Paul Rykoff, founder of Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America, about the toll that the 21st century wars have taken on our U.S. service members. But we're going to begin with NBC's Courtney Cuby and a look at how the Pentagon is getting ready for a war on Earth that could end up beginning in cyberspace or even outer space. After nearly 20 years of fighting, for many Americans, these are the images of war. American troops battling terror groups, Al-Qaeda and the Taliban in the mountains and caves of Afghanistan, ISIS in Iraqi towns and villages, and throughout the Syrian desert. But the way that we fight the next major war is going to look very different from the way that we fought the last ones. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin says those conflicts are quickly becoming obsolete. So what we need is the right mix of technology and operational concepts and capabilities all woven together and networked in a way that is so credible, so flexible, and so formidable that it will give any adversary pause. So what will the future of war look like? The likely adversary may have more cutting-edge technology than ever. Imagine U.S. satellites suddenly stop working. One, two, three, maybe ten go dark, crippling U.S. communications networks on Earth. The U.S. may not know for days whether it's facing an attack or a malfunction. The opening salvo in a conflict could be underway before the U.S. knows it's been hit or who's behind it. If you look at Chinese military doctrine, the first hours and days would be focused on large-scale cyber attacks against our critical infrastructure here at home to try to prevent military bases from sending forces out into the region, um, and also in space um, to prevent us from being able to communicate, to see, to target, to command and control. Here on Earth, a cyber attack against U.S. critical infrastructure could disrupt the electrical grid, transportation networks, or the flow of financial networks possible acts of war without a single shot fired. U.S. cyber defenses are not adequate today. Retired Admiral James Stavridis spent 37 years in the military and served as Supreme Allied Commander of NATO. We clearly have a great deal of work to do on the defensive side in cyber. And at the same time, we need to ensure that our own offensive cyber tools are sharp because that creates deterrence. Another concern, a cyber attack that targets U.S. satellites, sparking a conflict. Do you think it's possible that the next war here on Earth could start in space? If it were to start in space, I think that it would be uh, reasonable to think that we may see something in the space domain before we would see it in the air, land, and sea domains. General James Dickinson is the first leader of U.S. Space Command, a new regional command responsible for military operations in space. Our overall mission is to deter a war from happening in space. But if a war does happen, then our job is to make sure that we're able to uh, win, that, uh, win that operation. I also have the protect and defend mission for our capabilities on orbit. Capabilities like satellites that Americans rely on every day. Everything we touch practically depends, almost all touches space in some manner, whether it's GPS for getting around town in your car or a plane to get from point A to point B, going to have a, a transaction at the grocery store, ATM withdrawal, going to the doctor. In space, the U.S. faces threats from cyber attacks, anti-satellite missiles, lasers, and high-energy jammers. The U.S. intends to supplement large, expensive, vulnerable satellites with hundreds of smaller, more resilient models additional satellites with overlapping capabilities, meaning an enemy would have to destroy or disable more to impact U.S. operations. 
The U.S. plans to put 300 smaller satellites in space over the next five years, providing instant communications between troops and weapon systems on Earth. I believe that the United States is still the best in space. And what we need to do at this point is to continue to uh, increase our advantage in space. Even if war begins with a cyber attack or an incident in space, the conflict would be fought here on Earth. At sea, the U.S. has more aircraft carriers and naval power than any other nation. But the era of the supercarrier may be ending. Naval dominance may soon depend on subs, small unmanned sea drones, and hypersonic missiles. The era of the supercarrier is not over, but it is in its twilight as hypersonic cruise missiles, cyber, undersea threats increase, even in an era of truly endless surveillance from space, these large platforms become harder to defend and more difficult in order to use them offensively against a peer level opponent like Russia or China. The fight for air dominance is also changing. Drone swarms, stealth technology, and advanced fighter aircraft will rule the air in future wars. Do you think that the U.S. has air superiority over China in a potential conflict? No. Everybody remembers Desert Storm and how successful that operation was. So we go in, we establish air superiority, and then that gives us freedom of action in the maritime domain, on land, to sort of go ahead and prosecute operations. And those days are gone when we talk about either China or Russia. The Russian military has invaded Ukraine and backed the Syrian regime. And the Russian government has launched cyber attacks and even attacked dissidents in other sovereign nations. China has increased its military activity around Taiwan, built man-made islands into military bases in the South China Sea, and has declared international airspace and waterways their own territory. The chance of conflict is intensifying, especially if China sees the U.S. as vulnerable to attack. It could strike. I think in the long term, there is a, a growing risk of conflict with China because of the potential for miscalculation. Also looming, Iranian threats against the U.S. in the Persian Gulf and the Strait of Hormuz, plus North Korea. They have tested long-range intercontinental ballistic missiles capable of hitting the U.S. And they have thousands of artillery launchers along the DMZ pointed at Seoul. Hundreds of thousands could be quickly killed, drawing the U.S. into war. And the threat from terror networks is still very real. Al-Qaeda, ISIS, Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab, these are global, radical, Islamic terrorist groups. They still pose a significant threat to the United States, to our Western allies. We have not sort of really repostured ourselves from the 9-11 wars, if you will, to the kind of challenges we're going to face uh, with China uh, in the future. Is the U.S. ready for the next war? No. I don't think most Americans have really thought about the possibility, even though we see tensions rising in a much more competitive environment. Um, I don't think we've really gone to school to understand the Chinese strategic calculus and how we can affect that calculus as part of deterrence. No nation is ever truly ready for the next war it faces. You go to war in the end with the military you have, not the one that you hope you have. We are getting better and better at those 21st century tools of war. Let's hope we don't have to actually use them and hope that they create the deterrence that allows us to avoid the next war. Well, joining me now is the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. It's retired Admiral Mike Mullen. Admiral Mullen, it's good to see you. I appreciate you doing this. Let me just start with the issue of military readiness, right? That is a phrase, buzzword you hear. Um, but you break it down. There's sort of three questions that it's my understanding that many, many of you learn, which is, OK, ready for what, ready for when, and what needs to be ready? How do you assess our readiness for America's next war? Well, I, I mean, first of all, I, I thought that was a really good piece, Chuck, that covers, you know, a comprehensive look at uh, what we're facing. Uh, I would say that 
many of these concerns have been raised for years and that the military uh, has looked at what the what the challenges will be in each of these domains over time. So I think we're ready, we're more ready than sometimes people will give us credit uh, uh, in, in terms of preparation. Uh, I, there, there clearly is a sea change, if you will, uh, and a shift to China. And I think China is the, the, you know, the elephant in the room in terms of its uh, potential uh, impact, its growth, its economy, uh, that area of the world centers uh, for the five top economies, uh, and clearly their military growth has been significant. However, and this is probably partly because I've been around a while, uh, I don't want to paint them or anybody else as 10 feet tall. The challenges are significant. I think military leadership for years has recognized that these changes are going to occur. The shift is very difficult, particularly against some of the old capabilities that we have, but it is ongoing. And I think we're heading in the right direction. The leadership gets this. Right. Uh, the other thing, just, just quickly, that sort of gets overlooked, but uh, General McConville's comment uh, yep. about people is absolutely critical. We still have the best people in the world, the best military in the world. And in that regard, uh, we are well on our way for what we need to do in this 21st century. I, you know, Admiral Mullen, I, I've always felt the leadership has understood where we go next. But a lot of times you will make recommendations and asks and Congress will decide, yeah, well, uh, I need this factory to keep making this tank. Um, and, you know, to go back to President Eisenhower, is the military industrial complex that has sort of fused itself in our political system made it more difficult to get us ready? Um, I, it's just a challenge, Chuck. I, I don't know that it's more difficult. Certainly, I think President Eisenhower had it right. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the military industrial complex is massive, and it's harder for all of us to let go of what they've been doing to do what's, uh, what's right in the future. There's no question about that. But my engagement with them over decades is the leaders in that complex, by and large, get this need. They may not like to move as quickly as we would like them to move. Uh, uh, and, and in addition, the leadership on the Hill, by and large, gets this as well. There's a great poll uh, in terms of the jobs in certain districts that support certain right. systems, the, et cetera. I, I, I get all that. But that's not, that's not new. And quite frankly, it's something we can deal with. And by and large, that's a relatively small percentage of the budget. It gets a lot of play. It gets a lot of visibility, but it's right. a relatively small percentage of the budget the military or the president actually sends over in terms of national security requirements for the Pentagon. Let's dive into China. I think the concern that many people have about China, it's a concern that I share, is do they fear uh, a long-term conflict with the United States? We know the Russians do. Right. They can't they don't. You know, at the end of the day, they can't win a long term battle with us. They may be able to inflict damage. North Korea, that, that has always been sort of our our trump card, this perception. All right. You may be able to inflict early damage, but you're never going to be able to to beat the Americans long term. Does China think that or fear that? Um, I, I think that they would at least in their doctrine. Uh, and as was pointed out in your piece, I think Michelle Florney laid it out well, they yeah. they would move quickly to try to put our lights out, put our information out, et cetera. But we know that, and it's not like we haven't been preparing for that and we'll be better prepared for that uh, in the future. Uh, I think that you know, anyone uh, fears a long-term war. It isn't like if we got into a war with them, we'd like it to go a long time. I think our ability to sustain it over time uh, is, is probably better uh, than than what the Chinese leadership has. Uh, that said, you know it's a massive country, a massive population with lots of capability. But I also back to my ten foot tall thing. I don't want to, uh, you know, throughout the Cold War, the Soviets we talked about them like they were ten feet tall, and they just in the end weren't. Chinese are not ten feet tall either, and they have capabilities. It's growing, but they're going to be in significant trouble 
if they start a war with us. You, you pointed out Taiwan. That's clearly yeah. a hot spot, uh, potentially. Uh, and what the Chinese would like to do is if they decide to try to take Taiwan is do that quickly. There's no question right. about that. I think anybody from a if you're uh, in, in war and you're, and you're a leader in that regard would like it to end quickly. But we're not going to let that happen. Uh, I think, uh, you know, Admiral Stavridis said in your piece, the whole goal here is to make sure we don't go to war and that we're strong enough to send that message. So today is not the day the Chinese would decide to do that. I want to talk to you about the issue of, of AI uh, and drone warfare. And let me ask it this way. The more you take out the human element in combat, do you fear it will make leaders think the cost isn't as great, therefore maybe trying something damaging is, is uh, less risky? Do you fear that mindset changing if we sort of automate the battlefield? Yeah, I've been concerned about that for years, Chuck. As you know, in these wars we just uh, are ending, we use drones a great deal. And, and there's a part of that that doesn't put our men and women in harm's way. Uh, and sometimes it becomes too easy to use those systems because that you're not putting people in harm's way. It actually is putting people in harm's way uh, that motivates the attention the American people sustains or or pushes back on the support, et cetera. And I'm not arguing we should look to, to do that, certainly in large numbers. That said, I think the human element here is key. Two ways. One is to, to ensure that we have uh, situational awareness about what we're actually doing you know, in a, in a war zone. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and secondly, I think having the humans in the loop, even in in, in uh, remote systems or autonomous systems is something that uh, we should uh, make sure we have in the future so that that intellectual capital is always right. driving what we do from a war fighting standpoint. The current size of our enlisted military, uh, the assumption is it's going to shrink. Is that, is that a correct assumption? Um, I think, and this goes in cycles, uh, I mean, I think when the, you know, when the Democrats come in, usually the the defense budget, there's a lot of pressure. And when the republics come in, typically uh, the adjustment is in the other direction. I think it will uh, to some degree, but I don't think it will shrink uh, massively, if you will. Um, I, and I've actually felt for some time, and this is a fairly controversial uh, uh, view, that uh, we can afford to downsize our uh, army, our ground force there, if you will, given the challenges in the 21st century and invest in the Navy and the Air Force. I have little credibility in that regard because I'm a Navy <laughs> guy, <know>. but I'm <laughs> a joint guy and I've been through right. this. And there comes a time for the right investment in the right service. And the world right now, I think, is speaking to that particular need. But more importantly, Chuck, if we yeah. decide to go to war the next time, I don't want to be able to put 100,000 people in a uh, troops in a country and a year later, after the first deployment, be able to relieve them. I'd like the Army to be small enough so that if we decide to do that, we have that debate at every dinner table in every family. It's got an 18-year-old uh, that could possibly get drafted because I'll need another 100,000 another, uh, 100, or 500,000, roughly, uh, uh, draftees, if you will, to meet that commitment. I need that debate to happen in terms of whether we go yep. to war or not. Absolutely. Admiral Mike Mullen, it's always great to get your expertise and perspective. It's good to see you, sir. So thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, sir. Thanks. And coming up after the break, we're going to take a look at the men and women who fought our last war and how they're doing. Stick around. Welcome back. As we think about the posture that America needs to take for the next war we may face, there is still a lot to be done about America's last wars, especially doing right by those who fought them. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, four and a half million veterans served in the U.S. Armed Forces since 9-11, bearing an immense physical and mental cost. Forty percent of disability ratings from the Department of Veterans Affairs. Forty percent compared to a quarter of veterans overall. So joining me now is the founder of the Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America, 
Paul Rykoff. Paul, uh, it's good to see you. Let me start here. We're talking about preparing for America's next war in this special. It feels as if the VA was not ready for our last war. What are the lessons learned? I mean, you, you have founded this organization because the VA wasn't meeting the demands of these 21st century veterans. What is there to learn about that experience that we move forward for the VA as they prepare for America's next veterans? Caring for veterans should be a part of the initial battle plan. It should be a part of the initial congressional authorizations, if, they're, if that even happens. It should be a part of the budgeting. It should be a part of the forward planning. Uh, you know, 10 years after the war started, we were still trying to talk about PTSD and depression and suicide. It shouldn't take that long. When America commits our country to war, it should commit to paying the bill on what it takes to care for those people afterwards. We've got almost 2 million people who've served since 9-11. It's been 20 years of sacrifice, 20 years of wounds, 20 years of family hardship. And the war in Afghanistan may finally be winding down, but the war for the veterans who've served there will last for an entire generation. We always say never forget. Well, if we never forget on 9-11 and we never forget all that happened around that time, we've got to never forget about the veterans who've been stepping up for the two decades since. I want to focus on the PTSD aspect and the mental health, because that seems to be where the VA was just came up short. And I think about where we're headed with drone wars, perhaps, and the ability for the military to understand the mental stress that impacts somebody that is operating those. Even they may not be, quote, on the battlefield, but they're in the battlefield. Um, do you think this VA is prepared today to deal with these kind of mental uh, distress issues? No. They're making up ground, and they've been making up ground for 20 years. And before that, they were making up ground after the Gulf War and after Vietnam. We're always behind the curve here. Uh, and, and I think we've also got to recognize that new things happen in between. COVID devastated the veterans community, uh, the 9-11, post-9-11 veterans community, but especially World War II veterans. Every time you saw a, a male veteran dying in a nursing home, there was a good chance it was a World War II veteran. So this community has been hit very hard over the last year, but they've also responded. They're going to step up to fight the next wars, which I think mm -hmm. need to be focused, obviously, on, on domestic extremism and on cyber. Uh, we stepped up for the fight of our time, which was the post-9-11 fight. We fought for the most recent fight of our time, which was COVID, and we're going to be ready for the next fights. And that means cyber, and that means uh, domestic security and domestic extremism, but it also means having a VA that can finally look ahead of the curve. And there's no greater right. example than the fact that we basically neglected all women veterans for the last right. 20 years. Like, they didn't know in 9-11 that we were going to send women to fight, and now 20 years later, we still have to ensure they're not being sexually assaulted in our own military and inside our own VA. But it's even more than that. I mean, we saw an alarming statistic that as women ver veterans are over twice as likely to have no income um, after they come home. What I, is the VA or, uh, just not prepared or uh, do they understand how to deal with women's health and women's issues? They're getting better, but they've got a long way to go. And I think it's a really important strategic shift for us to understand it can't just be VA. For a long time, yeah. only half of my generation of veterans were even using the VA. So we need a commander in chief who sets out a strategic plan to care for the 2 million people who've served since 9 11. Biden's the right guy to do it. He's the only commander in chief who's had a, a child in combat since 9 11. It's been a few decades. He understands the cost of war, and he can be the guy that finally sets out a strategic plan for how to care for these people. That includes universities and faith based communities and hospitals. It's got to be a comprehensive national fight. Uh, otherwise, it's just going to be left over to the VA, and it's going to be somebody else's budget and somebody else's problem, and that's the wrong way to do it. Uh, do you think some of the VA's problems has an impact on whether our volunteer force still wants to volunteer? Absolutely. I mean, when, when people, you know, think about joining the military right now and, and they see that, uh, you know, Women veterans are sexually assaulted and sexually harassed inside VA facilities. They see that they've waited for a long time for proper care. Uh, we're still now fighting for toxin exposure recognition. This is our generation's Agent Orange. But you got to remember that the Vietnam vets fought for almost 40 years yeah. to get Agent Orange recognized. We only had to fight, thankfully, 20 years to get burn pits recognized. So if you're a young man or woman, you're understandably reluctant. We need them to serve. We need better incentives. And we need a public case for not just why they need to 
to serve, but how we'll ensure they're taken care of when they get home. And that's the ultimate social compact that our country and our commander in chief has with our men and women. And it's important to remember around July 4th, when we all celebrate our independence right. and we recognize the freedoms we have, we've got to prove it. You know, we've talked a lot on, on the health care aspect. What about on, on employment and education? I mean, look, there are some we, we got some version of sort of the uh, a GI bill of sorts that was back a, a, a decade ago. What more would you like to see done? That, that GI Bill was transformative. It sent over a million men and women to college. It was a great bipartisan uh, yeah, agenda where you saw Senator Warner, who recently passed, a World War II vet and Republican, working with a Democrat, Senator Jim Webb. Uh, you know, you saw real bipartisan support. And I think that gives us hope for what can happen going forward. Uh, we need transferability of benefits for people who want to start small businesses. We need access to capital for people who do want to be entrepreneurial. We need retraining support. And to the point for women, we need the country to understand that women veterans exist. And they've been through a lot. They've served our country. And now they're ready to serve on the front lines of rebuilding America as we bounce back after COVID. That's the silver lining here. They've been through so much and they can help us go forward. They just need a little support. Paul Rykoff, you have been a champion of the Iraq and Afghanistan uh, veterans, the 21st century veterans here. And there's nobody that can help tell us how do we prepare for the next war. We also got to prepare to take care of the next veterans and these. Paul, good to see you, sir. You too, Chuck. Thanks. And that's all we have for Meet the Press Reports this week. You can catch previous episodes and previous seasons of Meet the Press Reports right here on Peacock. Binge away right now. Check out our recent shows on extremism, athlete activism, millennial politics, and much more. As you can see, it's a pretty broad and diverse scope that we focus on. And we'll see you next time. And, of course, we'll see you this Sunday on Meet the Press. Hey, thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.